Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, with Moffitt Library and Goshen Library. We have a real treat for you tonight. Um, we're here with Joe Rayo, uh, the famous meteorologist for, um, I think it was News 12. Uh, he has uh, done articles for space.com and live science, and he is a uh, guest lecturer and educator with um, the Museum of Natural History as well. And today uh, we will be taking a closer look at how um, the solar system can affect weather and long-term weather predictions. So you don't need to listen to me anymore. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Joe, and take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, David, and uh, good evening to all of you on a rather unsettled weather evening, but uh, that's the nice thing about doing these things virtually. You didn't have to, and I know it, it must be wonderful to go uh, and visit periodically the both the MOFAD library and the Goshen libraries, but for a, a situation like tonight, it's nice to be able to participate in a library talk without having to leave your home. Uh, you can watch it on your PC or on your phone. And tonight, uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking to all of you about the science, or maybe I should call it the pseudoscience of astrometeorology. Can we possibly predict the weather using the sun, the moon, or even the motions of the planets? To do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, share my screen. Uh, we're going to do a PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> And to do that, I'm going to share the screen right now and uh, go to, um, let's see here, my slideshow. You're talking to somebody who not, up until fairly recently was still using an old ectographic slide projector. So <laughs> uh, uh, the, this whole thing with PowerPoint and um, live virtual stuff is still relatively new to me. But I hope all of you now can see on your screen the observer's handbook cover. And you look at this and you say to yourself, well, um, what does this have to do with weather? Well, it doesn't really, but I wanted to show you, first of all, a book. And also, by the way, from time to time, I'm going to pause for five or six or seven seconds so that I can take a swig, as I will do right now, of my bottle of Poland spring water. Since I'm going to be jabbering away for about an hour, uh, I always want to. Uh, kind of moisten my throat, which I'm doing right now. <clears throat> now this book that you see on the screen, The Observer's Handbook, if you are an amateur or professional astronomer, this is a very, very important publication to have. This book tells you all of the celestial events that are going to happen during the upcoming year, during the year 2022. It will tell you about eclipses of the sun and moon, it will tell you about comets that are expected to pass uh, by the Earth and possibly become visible to the eye. Meteor showers. When will two planets come close together in the nighttime sky, what we call a conjunction? Um, a whole lot of other stuff. But the thing about this book is everything is precise. If, for example, they tell you that on Sunday night, May 15th, we're going to have a total eclipse of the moon that will begin precisely at 10.32 p.m., which is what is going to happen this year on Sunday night, May 15th. We're going to have a total eclipse of the moon. It's going to kick off at 10.32. Not 10.31, not 10.30, not approximately 10 o'clock, 10.32. This book, because we know about the motions of the planets, we know where the moon is going to be in its orbit at any given moment. They can be calculated down almost to this precise second. Everything is determined to, the, the, again, the, the nearest minute or the nearest second, you can count on it. it will, if I tell you that, th that this book tells you that the sun is going to rise tomorrow here in the New York area at 7, 12 a.m., bank on it. It will. There's no ands, ifs, or buts. This book is the perfect book if you want to anticipate and observe celestial events, again, coming up in the upcoming year. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be great if we had a book like this, like for covering weather? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a book where we can open it up and we can 
to, to, to let's say the 4th of July and look at that book and it will tell us whether or not it's going to be sunny on the 4th of July or hot on the 4th of July or it's going to rain on the 4th of July. How about are we going to have a white Christmas this year on December 25th? Wouldn't it be great if we had a book that can tell you we open it up and there it is the prediction for the Christmas or maybe your birthday or maybe some of you are getting married. Find out what the weather's going to be on your prospective wedding date. Wouldn't it be one of, well, guess what? We do. In fact, we have not just one, but two such books that can do, do that for you. The Old Farmer's Almanac and The Farmer's Almanac. Now, The Farmer's Almanac has been publishing continuously since 1818. You see that there. 18, so it's been around for over 200 years, quite a long, lengthy stretch of, of, of publication. Now, the other almanac is called the Old Farmer's Almanac because they've been around even older than that, 1792. In fact, you see here that this almanac, the Old Farmer's Almanac, this is number 230. It has been uh, published every year for 200 and 30 years. And in either one of these books, just like the Observer's Handbook, you can open it up to the weather page and find out what the weather is going to be on a specific date in the year 2022. Of course, the difference between the Celestial Handbook or the Observer's Handbook and the Farmer's Almanac or Old Farmer's Almanac, the difference is I could look in the Observer's Handbook and I, as I said a few moments ago, we know precisely when an event is going to occur to the minute, to the second sometimes. And we know that it is going to happen 100% certainty, no ands, if or buts. But now if we look up the weather forecast for either one of these almanacs, they can't say that. No, not even the best almanac is 100% as far as weather predictions. These two almanacs though, claim that they have a pretty good track record. Uh, depending upon which one you pick up, uh, it varies anywhere between 70 and 80% accuracy. So they, at least they claim that they have a pretty good record. But how do they do that? How is it possible that they could forecast these forecasts that are published in these respective almanacs were probably put together one or even two years ago? One or two years ago, these forecasts were made and then published and then put out on newsstands and in bookstores. How is that possible that they could get away with something like that? And how is it possible that they could claim such a high degree of accuracy? What are they using to make forecasts? Maybe they're making forecasts using the moon, the motions of the moon around the earth. We know precisely where the moon is going to be at any given moment in its orbit. And maybe, just maybe, the moon has a say in our climate, in our weather. Now, just to give you an idea that this possibly is the case, here is a table for telling weather through all of the lunations of each year. Lunation is of a lunar month. The moon goes from full moon to full moon or new moon to new moon every 29 and a half days. 29 and a half day period, that is called a lunation or a loon, if you will, or kind of the, the equivalent of a month. In fact, we get the term month from the word month. A month on average is what, about 30 days long, which is pretty close to that 29 and a half day period for the moon. But now, according to this table, if we knew when the moon was going to change its phase, in other words, if we knew precisely the moment when the moon turned new or full or first quarter or last quarter, that would help us using this during this uh, uh, graph or this table as to what to expect as far as the weather is concerned. Now, I believe we have the Lunar New Year, which just happened, and that is always associated with a new moon. So I'm just going to get out. I have a copy here of the Farmer's Almanac. Let me just see here in the Farmer's Almanac when this new moon occurred. When was the moment of new moon this month? So this is today is February 3rd. And we had a new moon occur on February 1st. 
at 1246 AM. OK, that's good. Now we know when the, full, when the moon turned new. <clears throat> that would be the time of change on this map would be midnight to 2 AM. If it were summertime, according to this, it would be fair. If it were wintertime, we would expect a hard frost. Well, uh, I, I must tell you, it has been cold. Certainly, uh, uh, we've had more than our fair share of frost. So I would have to say that I would give it to the Farmer's Almanac, uh, or not the Farmer's Almanac, but this table, as far as predictions are concerned. But is it right all the time? Well, I haven't had the time to actually sit down and uh, grade this. Although it does say that this table was created more than 160 years ago by Dr. Herschel for the Boston Courier. And it first appeared in the Old Farmer's Almanac in 1834. Now the editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac would like to say that while the data in this table are taken into consideration in the year long forecast compiling the uh, annual long range weather forecast for the Farmer's Almanac, the Old Farmer's Almanac, that they rely more on their projections of solar activity. So they don't really use the moon. Uh, the Old Farmer's Almanac apparently relies more heavily on uh, the uh, activity going on on the sun. More on that later. But now here's a gentleman. His name is Elias Loomis. He was an American mathematician in the mid to late 19th century. And I mean, doesn't this look like somebody who was a scientist in the 19th century? He looks like a scientist. He's got that, that uh, expression on his face that he's scholarly. And of course, he has the beard that makes him look even more scholarly or whatever. Anyway, he wrote a book called A Treatise of uh, Meteorology uh, in the year 1868. One of the things that he wrote in this book, again, this is Elias Loomis, is that the atmosphere is very much like the ocean. And that if that be the case, we could predict the weather using the motions of the moon because the motions of the moon control the tides, right? We, you've seen tide tables. We know when there's gonna be high tides and low tides because we know where the moon is in its orbit and how the moon with its gravitational pull pulls on the ocean, making them rise and fall twice a day, again, because of the moon's gravity. And Elias Loomis said in 1868 that the moon has a similar attraction on our atmosphere because the atmosphere is very much like the oceans. It's, it's fluid. It, 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 and you know, if you ask a meteorologist today about that, he might say, eh, well, uh, not really, uh, maybe a little, but not really all that much. But I wanna show you a picture here. This is an interesting picture. This is a picture not of the ocean. These are clouds. They are called Kelvin Heimholtz clouds or billow clouds or shear gravity clouds. And they occur when we have different densities of air, when we have an atmospheric inversion. Now, normally under many cases, when you ascend, if you were to get in the, into a balloon, like you know the Wizard of Oz, for example, <laughs> and if you were to fly in that balloon up into the atmosphere, the higher up you go, the colder it gets. That's how it usually is. But sometimes you have what's called an atmospheric inversion. And the opposite is true, that it actually warms as, it, as you go higher up into the atmosphere for a short while. That's almost like a, an upside down effect an inversion, a flip, uh, if you will. And when we have one of those kind of inversions, when warm air overrides colder air near the surface, you get these strange, weird billowing clouds. But I wanna show you even more dramatic view of how the atmosphere looks somewhat like uh, the ocean. This was taken from a high mountaintop uh, looking, you've heard of the term overcast. Well, this is not an overcast. This is the top of the mountain looking down into cloud cover. This is an undercast, but look at the clouds. Look at the way that they are acting. This is a time-lapse sequence here, but look at this, the rolling. It almost looks like waves on the, the ocean floor, on the ocean surface. This is, this is amazing. What an amazing view. Maybe Loomis was right. Maybe the atmosphere indeed kind of acts like the ocean sometime. And could it be that maybe 
the, the pull of the moon uh, acts on the atmosphere and that we could use the moon to make predictions, projections about the uh, future weather. Now, here's uh, an interesting uh, limerick here. I don't know exactly who wrote it, but it, it, it basically sums up what most meteorologists today believe, that the moon and the weather may change together, but change of the moon does not change the weather. If we'd no moon at all, and that may seem strange, we'd still enjoy weather that's subject to change. In other words, if there was no moon in the sky, we'd still have weather and it would change. The moon would then have nothing to do with it. Well, this gentleman may have had something else to say about that. This man's name is Harry Geis. I'm sure that all of you who are watching now don't know who Harry Geis is, don't recognize the face, but for a one year interval in 1966, Harry Geis was the weatherman, the meteorologist on WCBS TV here in New York Channel 2. You see, it's interesting, television weather has gone through a number of different phases or stages. In the 1950s and early 60s, there was a period when, when you flicked on the, the TV and turned on the news to see the weather. In most cases, the weather was presented to you by a rather attractive young lady. There were weather girls out there. That was how it was back in the 50s and early 60s. In, 19, in the early 1960s, I could remember, for example, on Channel 2, uh, a young lady by the name of Carol Reed. And I liked watching Carol Reed. If for nothing else, at the end of her forecast, she'd always say at the end of the forecast, and you have a happy, have a happy. She was famous for that. And everybody enjoyed watching Carol Reed. On Channel 11, another station I used to like to watch because they used to show uh, Captain Jack and Popeye cartoons and, <laughs> and, and uh, Officer Joe Bolton. He'd show the uh, old uh, Three Stooges uh, films. Well, on Channel 11, they had a young lady named Gloria Ocon. And Gloria Ocon did the weather sponsored by Arnold Bread. In fact, she would even sing the Arnold Bread jingle. And then after she sang the jingle, she'd give you the weather. So weather ladies or weather girls were very, very prominent and very famous and very well liked and very popular in the 1950s and early 60s. Then in 1966, Channel 4 here in New York, WNBC, suddenly came onto a new personality to do the weather. A gentleman who some of you older folks will remember, Dr. Frank Field. Dr. Frank Field was a, a bona fide scientist. Uh, the doctor was for the fact that he got in an optometry, but he also worked at the US Weather Bureau for a while and he knew all about weather. And also he showed things like radar and satellite pictures. The, the weather ladies didn't do that. Dr. Frank Field was, and they promoted him as the first real scientist doing the weather in New York. Well, this didn't sit well with Channel 2. And Channel 2 said, well, we've got to get our own scientist. And that's why they ended up getting Harry Geis. Harry Geis was from California. And so they lured Harry Geis to New York with a nice contract, a one-year contract. And they said goodbye to Carol Reed. Everybody was very upset when Carol Reed left. And they brought this guy in, Harry Guy. How, why did they do that? I, I love watching Carol Reed. What is this guy? What, is, what can he do? Harry Geis's specialty was long range forecasts, long range. And when he came to Channel 2, Channel 2 said, all right, Harry, do your stuff. And one night, it was the uh, Columbus Day weekend. And Harry Guy stepped in front of the camera and said, before I give you the forecast, for this holiday weekend. I wanna tell all of you something and I want you to mark it down. We're gonna have a big snowstorm just in time for Christmas. A big snowstorm, not just a few flurries. There's not gonna be a, 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 some snow that's already on the ground on Christmas morning. We are going to have a slam bang snowstorm just in time for Christmas 1966. And every time we had a holiday, Veterans Day, He'd remind everybody about his four. He said, you remember what I told you back on Columbus Day about the snowstorm on Christmas? It's still coming. Thanksgiving. The Christmas season officially opens up on Thanksgiving. And I remember Harry Guy said, he said, I want to remind you all, big snowstorm for Christmas. 
you better get your Christmas shopping in early. If you do it, let's say on the last day on Christmas Eve, you're going to have some problems because I think we're going to have a big storm. And, you know, you watch this and you say, this is crazy. How does he know there's going to be a, a big storm on Christmas for just in time for Christmas? How does he know? The, 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 is he taking a wild guess or whatever? But he sounds so sure, so certain. And look at this. This is a map showing you the amount of snow that fell December 23rd to December 25th, Christmas Day. Look at that. Look at the legend. In the area of white, everywhere that's white on this map, four to 10 inches of snow. Look at the area of blue, light blue. That encompassed part of the Hudson Valley and areas to the north and west of New York City, 10 to 20 inches. And look at this, in those blotches of dark blue, 20 to 30 inches of snow. This all happened just in time for the Christmas holiday. And there's the front page of the Christmas Day New York Times. Snow brings city a white Christmas. It was the first white Christmas since 1961. Look at these two travelers, these shoppers. They don't look very happy. They didn't listen to Harry Geis. He told them, get your shopping done early. Don't wait until the day before Christmas because you're going to be doing it in cold and you're going to be doing it in snow. Amazing. How did he know? How did he do it? Did he use the moon? Well, let's see. There are lunar cycles. There's a cycle called the Metonic cycle, a period of 19 years, 235 lunar months, a lunation. Again, I, a lunar month is 29 and a half days. And after 19 years, the new and full moons will return to the same days of the year. It was the basis for the ancient Greek calendar and is still used for calculating movable feasts such as Easter Sunday. Now, what this says is, is that at periods of 19 years, the moon pretty much is in the same part of its orbit that it was 19 years ago or will be 19 years in the future. So here's the question. Did Harry Geis use the metonic cycle? Did he look and check to see where the moon was in 1947, 19 years earlier? Remember, this is 1966, and 19 years earlier was 1947. So was there a big snowstorm in 1947? And he, sa he saw that, and he said, well, if it happened in 47, it's going to happen again in 1966. Was there a big storm? Wow. Yes, there was a big storm. This was two days after Christmas, telling us about the record 25 inches of snow that crippled New York City, slowed traffic. Long Island was disrupted. Thousands were marooned. Now, this, this is most interesting, that a big storm happened around Christmas in 1947, and maybe Harry Geis figured that 19 years later, it'd be another similar storm that happened that would happen on Christmas in 1966. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. I'll tell you why. So 1966, 1947, there's a big snow, Christmas. 1966, big Christmas storm. What happened in 1980? Do you remember the big snowstorm that happened Christmas time in 1985, the big, big uh, snow that hit New York around Christmas time that year in 85? Do you remember that? You don't. You know why you don't remember it? Because it didn't happen. It didn't happen. See, it's not that simple. I mean, big you know, weather events don't happen uh, every 19 years with regularity. It didn't happen in 1985. So maybe there was something else that Harry Geis used in making this forecast, making this prediction. Like for example, the lunar distance. The moon goes around the earth in an ellipse. It goes around the earth so that at one end of that ellipse, it's far away from the Earth. This is what we call apogee, 252,000 miles from the Earth, 252,000 miles. Then on the other side of that orbit, the moon comes in relatively closer to the Earth. This is what we call perigee, 221,000 miles away. The difference between the two, uh, 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 the difference between the two amount of miles that, uh, that the moon is from the Earth, the closest and the farthest, is about 14%. So 
So when the moon is far away, it looks 14% smaller than when it is at its closest point, when it's at perigee. And by the way, something that has become very popular over the last 10 or 12 years is the term super moon. Super moon is when the moon is at perigee, closest to the earth, and also at full moon phase. And so we gauge that in the sky, the moon appears largest. The biggest moon of the year is when the full moon coincides with the time of lunar perigee, when it's closest to the earth. So when the moon is closest to the earth and at full phase, or maybe even at new phase when we can't see it, does that have a say in our weather? Well, this man certainly thought so. And this man was another one of those scientists, uh, or maybe he wasn't necessarily a scientist. Uh, he, he dabbled in science. And his name was Stephen Martin Saxby. And he lived in England, jolly old England, in the mid to late 19th century. And he wrote a letter during the summer of 1869 to his local newspaper, the Standard of London, and said, I have a prediction. The prediction involves the moon. The moon is going to be at new moon phase early in October, October the 5th of this year, 1869. But the moon is also going to be at that point in its orbit called perigee. It's going to be closest to the earth on that same day. And also, he said, the moon is going to be crossing the celestial equator. In other words, it's going to be moving directly over the equator when it was at new phase and when it was closest to the earth. And to this, he said there was going to be a storm, a tremendous storm that would bring cataclysmic floods and all kinds of problems, strong winds, rain. It, it, it was, it was, it's horrible what, it, what this storm was going to do. And he wrote this letter, was published in the Standard of London. The only thing that he missed or that he forgot to mention in his letter is, where's this gigantic storm going to occur? Where's it going to be? Is it going to be right here in Europe, in England? Are we here in the United Kingdom have to worry about a major storm on that day because of the influence of the moon? Or will it happen across the big pond in the United States? or somewhere else in the world. Where, where is this going to happen? Do you know that the Standard of London, the newspaper contacted Saxby and said, you have to write another letter. You have to clarify where this major storm is because we have people who are writing us, many, many people who are writing us that want to know where and when this storm is going to hit. And so Saxby obliged. He sent another letter which was published uh, some weeks before the, uh, the tempest, if you will. And if this wasn't a forecast, an open-ended forecast, I don't know what is. The warnings, he said, apply to all parts of the world. In other words, this big storm presumably would happen anywhere in or on the earth. The effects may be felt more in some places than in others. It is painful, he says, to have to forebode evil but better thus than to merit self-reproach under circumstances which might lead to permanent regrets, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> if you want to talk about double talk, there it is, folks. Could I save one life, he wrote, it would be very cheaply purchased in making better known certain laws of nature. This was the letter he wrote to the Standard of London, September 16th, 1869, approximately two to three weeks before the big storm, the big blow, of early October of that year. So basically he said, I don't know where this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen, but I can't tell you where or when. Nobody can. Well, maybe, maybe not necessarily so. Here is another man, and this one was living across the big pond from the United Kingdom. His name was Frederick Allison. And he wrote a weekly column on weather for his newspaper, the Halifax Evening Express. Now. In Frederick Allison's newspaper column, he would normally talk about the weather that had occurred the previous week. So if there was a big thunderstorm that caused, let's say, some strong winds and hail, he would write about it. He would say, well, you remember that big storm we had last Monday? 
or if it snowed, yeah, that, remember that big storm we just went through? They brought like 15 centimeters of snow because in Canada, they don't use inches. They, they measure snow in centimeters. He, he would do something like that. He never, ever wrote about a forecast. He never would say, a big storm is coming in his newspaper column because how would he know? How could he know? But Frederick Allison somehow must have found out about the prediction put out by uh, Mr. St Saxby, Stephen Saxby. And so for his column, his weather column in the Nova Scotia Halifax Evening Express on October 1st, uh, Frederick Allison wrote his very first outlook of his very first weather forecast. And this is, this, this is what it said. I believe that a heavy gale will be encountered here on Tuesday next, the 5th of October. Beginning perhaps on Monday night, possibly deferred as late as this Tuesday night, but between those two periods, it seems inevitable. So this guy was really, again, Saxby didn't say where the big storm was going to be. He didn't indicate any particular part of the globe where this big storm was going to take place. But Frederick Allison figured, well, what the heck? Why not? Let's, let's uh, assume that this is going to happen right in my own backyard, right here in Nova Scotia. So he placed this in his weekly uh, weather column. He said, roughly speaking, the warmer it may be on the 4th, the more violent will be the succeeding storm. Apart from the theory of the moon's attraction as applied to meteorology, which is disbelief by many. Did you, did, did you get that? Did you get that, that, that sentence there? Apart from the theory of the moon's attraction as applied to meteorology, which is disbelief by many. In other words, what he's saying is, is that most people poo-pooed the moon's attraction, the moon's influence on the weather. They, there were a lot of disbelievers, but, the experience of any careful observer teaches him to look for a storm at next new moon. So there he did, went. He, he went out and he stuck his neck out on October 1st and said that it was going to be a big storm around the 4th or 5th of October. Now, today, that's not a big deal. Turn on your TV and you will see that most television weather forecasters give you a seven-day outlook. There are even a couple of TV stations in this mar television market that will try to forecast the weather 10 days out. So, you know, a forecast for four days down the road, that's not a big deal. It's done every day of the week. But the one thing that today's TV weathercasters have that Frederick Allison, nor any other meteorologist or weather forecaster had back then, is that today we have radar, we have satellite, we have computer guidance, which provides us with the details as to any perspective or potential storm that may come our way in the days to come, many days to come. But they didn't have that back then. So to actually make a prediction, a forecast, more than let's say a day or two in advance, that really was something. And here Frederick Allison was taking the word of a guy across the ocean, Stephen Saxby, that there was gonna be a big storm and a big major system because of the closest of the moon relative to the earth and also because the moon was at new phase passing over the equator. Let's not forget that factor as well. Well, guess what? Guess what? When that newspaper column was published, little did Allison or anybody else in Nova Scotia know that there was a big storm, a category three storm, a hurricane that was located off the southeast coast of the United States. Now, nobody could have known that. There was no satellite pictures, no radar, no, no information that would provide that detail. We knew about it in the aftermath. But here now, this storm began to creep to the north. It moved northward, passed over Cape Cod. This was October 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th. October 5th, it made landfall in down east Maine and then passed off to the north on the 6th and the 7th. The worst place you can be, by the way, relative to a hurricane or tropical storm is on the right-hand side relative to the path of the storm. And look at this, Nova Scotia was in that zone, in that region. And sure enough, during the time frame that Allison had warned about and which Saxby had alluded to, look at what happened. Oh my goodness, you go to Nova Scotia today 
and in the weather annals, they still speak of this giant storm that hit in the early days of fall of 1869 and early October, a massive storm. And you know what? The funny thing is that even though Allison was the one who stuck his neck out and said, I think there's going to be a big storm around here. Everybody still refers to it not as Allison storm. They refer to it as the Saxby Gale. They, they give credit not to Allison, but to Saxby for forecasting that storm. Now, in October of the year 2001, I had an art, 2002, I should say, I had an article that was published in Weatherwise magazine. By the way, if any of you are interested in meteorology, if you have it, like it as a hobby, if you want to take it up and learn more about weather, I strongly urge you to purchase uh, or get a subscription to Weatherwise. Everybody, all the professional and amateur meteorologists and weather watchers and weather enthusiasts read this magazine. And so in October of 2002, I wrote an article for Weatherwise magazine called Moonstruck Meteorology and asked the question, is it lunacy to think that Saxby's Gale could recur this October? I, 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 what I did was I had a, uh, and I still have a computer program here at home, and I ran the computer program to find out when were the other times since 1869 that the moon was at new or full phase at its closest point to the earth or perigee, and at the same time crossing the equator, being directly above the equator when it was at its closest point to the earth, either at new or full phase. And I found out that the circumstances in October of 2002 were practically the same as what was happening or what had happened in October of 1869 when Saxby put out his uh, highly regarded forecast and, and Frederick Allison got all excited too. And I said, it's happening again. It's gonna happen again this year, October of 2002. Will we have another unusual storm that strikes Nova Scotia or somewhere along the Atlantic seaboard in October of this year? But it wasn't just Saxby's storm or Saxby's gale. There were a couple of other cases that had me interested in this. One such case, and here's a, 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 an artist drawing of, uh, of a ship that was wrecked. Um, there was, the, the, the mariners often referred to the time of the vernal or autumnal equinoxes as the time when we see line storms. The sun at the equinoxes crosses the equator and crossing the line, so to speak, and they were usually followed by major storms. And I checked up and I found that there were two other cases where the moon was close at full or new phase crossing the equator where there was some very interesting weather that took place. Here's the forecast. This was the official US Weather Bureau now called uh, the National Weather Service. This forecast was issued on March 22nd 1967. The moon was full. The moon was close to the earth. The moon was over the equator. And yet here's the forecast that the National Weather Service or then the United States Weather Bureau issued for New York City. Mostly cloudy today with a few snow flurries likely. Then clearing this evening and tonight. Highs today in the upper 30s, lows tonight near 30. No big deal. And it's March. It's spring, March 22nd, for goodness sake. And you know what happened? Goodbye, March 23rd, the New York Times, the day after that storm. Yeah, they had a few flurries. Oh yeah, they did have a few, 10 inches of flurries. Surprised the city, clogged the roads, delaying airlines and buses, precarious walking, high drifts. What happened? And look at this, continuation of the story on, uh, on some pages inside. This man, I don't know why he's smiling. This guy was the head of the United States Weather Bureau, which was then based at Rockefeller Center, Anthony Tancredo. And he said, you win some, you lose some, right? Normally, a storm like this would give up little or no snow. One meteorologist said, like a man trying to explain to his wife why he hadn't phoned when he missed the train. 
And Anthony Tancredo, the meteorologist in charge, compared this to uh, an operation, good surgery, that did not turn out well. The operation was successful, but the patient died. Oh, yes, there was a, a storm that was anticipated, but the storm got a lot stronger, a lot bigger than most people had expected, which dumped all of that snow on the New York area. That was one case, March of 1967. And then in March of 1993, 1993 was the superstorm, another full moon passing over the equator at the time that it was at perigee or closest to the earth. This monstrous storm dumped one to two feet of snow from New England to Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama had snow and the leading edge, the cold front associated with that system raked the southeastern states and Florida, creating numerous severe weather, thunderstorms, tornadoes. This storm was a massive storm. And again, looking at the front page of the Times, storm paralyzes East Coast. Storm covers the South, snow covers the South. Once again, all of this transpiring right around that time when the moon was this time full, when the moon was close to the earth, when the moon was crossing the equator. So I wrote in weather-wise, I said, hey, look, 1869 is one thing. 1967 is another. Then it happened again, 1993. Could it be that we're going to have an unusual scenario again this year in 2002? Well, look at this. This is September. September the 26th, 2002, we have a hurricane, a hurricane by the name of Kyle. Here's Puerto Rico. Here's the Dominican Republic. And off to the north and east, north and west, I should say, is the mainland United States. So how is the October situation regarding the moon, how is this going to affect that storm, Hurricane Kyle? Will it have an effect on Hurricane Kyle? Well, you know, when you have a hurricane out in the Atlantic Ocean, it generally takes one of three kinds of paths. It generally takes a path that takes it, let's say, south of Puerto Rico and uh, the Dominican Republic and Cuba and take it into the Gulf of Mexico where it may slam against the uh, Gulf Coast. Or it may go north of Puerto Rico, but continue on a track across Florida into the Gulf of Mexico, or take a gentle curve, taking it precariously close to the Atlantic seaboard and then curving it away from the Atlantic. Although in 1869, we had a storm that didn't curve quite so much, and instead it hit Cape Cod, New England, and Nova Scotia. What is go Hurricane Kyle going to do when we come up in that magic time frame in early October of, of 2002. Look at this. Look at this. This is the track that was taken by Hurricane Kyle. I have rarely ever seen a track. It looked like the, the hurricane was drunk. I mean, it made a loop here, then it went southwest, then northwest, then it came up close to the Atlantic seaboard to the west of Bermuda. Here's Bermuda. Made a curl right over here. A little, little curly cue. Then it swept on southwest again and made a big sweep around and up and through right along the immediate mid Atlantic and southeast coast. Was it the moon that caused Kyle to do that, or was it strange upper level jet stream winds? I leave it up to you. But I, I, have, I have been watching weather now for a number of years, and rarely since that time in 2002 have I seen any tropical system do this kind of a tropical flip-flop of curves and loops and everything else. So I, again, was it the moon? Again, I don't know, but uh, it is kind of weird, kind of strange. So now let's, we've, we've looked at the moon's influence. How about the sun? The sun, of course, is the most important celestial body to all of us. The sun provides all the heat and all the light. And without that sun, you and I would not be here right now. So what about the sun? Now, it's interesting. There are times during uh, the course of a year where the sun uh, shines like a you know, big glowing orange yellow ball in our sky. Other times they have the, the sun's surface is splotched, if you will, with these dark blotches. And, and these are called sunspots. They are actually solar storms, magnetic storms that go on 
on the photosphere, the surface of the sun. Now the photosphere of the sun is 11,000 degrees. The sunspots, the solar storms, are several thousand degrees cooler, more like seven or 8,000 degrees. So when you put something that much cooler against the bright solar you know, photosphere, they would appear to be dark. And that's why they look dark. But I can assure you that if you were to take a sunspot off the surface of the sun and put it up into our sky, it would be blindingly bright indeed. But in this case, the contrast between the backdrop or the background surface of the sun and these solar storms give the appearance that the sun spots are dark or black. Some early scientists even thought that they were holes in the sun, sculpted out on the sun's surface. And the sunspots appear in a cycle. We looked at the, some of the cycles regarding the moon. The sunspot cycle is on average about 11 years. Every 11 years on average, sunspots are particularly prolific. And you can see how, and, and, and we have recorded cycles, sunspot cycles. Uh, sunspot cycle 15 was in the early part of the 20th century, 1913 to 1923. And you can see how the sunspots ebb and flow. They peak and then they drop off. And then they peak and they drop off, up and down, up and down over a period of 11 years approximately or so. And right now we are in sunspot cycle 25. The first cycle was uh, first recorded back in the early part of the 19th century. We actually refer to them as the Carrington cycle, named after a gentleman who discovered uh, the solar cycle and also um, studied the sun, uh, a scientist by the name of Carrington. This scientist that you see on your screen right now is Jack Eddy. And Jack Eddy was a modern day scientist an American astronomer who studied sunspot records. Uh, sadly, Dr. Eddy died in 2009. The interesting thing about Dr. Eddy was that he was doing studies of early sunspot observations and he came across the studies done by a gentleman by the name of Edward Maunder. Maunder was a scientist who lived in the early 20th century. And Maunder claimed in some of his records that he found from 1645 to 1715, that there was not a single sunspot to be found on the sun's surface. Not a single sunspot, not a single blemish. It was blank for over 70 years. And John Eddy said, this is ridiculous. It's not possible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check on those, those records myself. I'm gonna disprove this guy, Maunder, and I'm gonna point out that uh, he, he, he was uh, somebody who was not very reliable. Well, you know what? After a while of doing some digging and studying on his own, Dr. Eddy, John Eddy had to come back and say, you know what? I was wrong. Maunder was right. There were no sunspots for whatever reason between 1645 and 1715. 70 years without any sunspots and probably any solar activity, no major solar flares, uh, nothing going on on the sun. It was quiet. He wrote a paper, Eddie did, Dr. Eddie did in 1976, and he referred to that as the Maunder Minimum, giving credit to, again, uh, uh, Mr. Maunder, Edward Maunder, for pointing this out, being the first one to point this out. But there was somebody else, a German astronomer who lived in the mid to late 19th century named Gustav Sporer. And Sporer said that there were also a time frame where there was a paucity of sunspots between the year 1420 and 1570. Now, wait a minute, hold on for a second. The telescope, which we use to study sunspots, the telescope, which Galileo used to be, the, was the first to see sunspots with his crude telescope, was not invented until the year 1610. So how is it that this German astronomer, Spora, could make such a proclamation that there were no sunspots between the year 1420 and 1570? Well, Spora was a different kind of scientist. He was a dendrochronologist. He was a guy who studied tree rings. And when there was an abundance of, 
uh, moisture, an abundance of wet weather and uh, warm temperatures, trees seem to grow much, much faster. Uh, you can see how wide the rings are over here, as opposed to over here where they were a bit narrower. He pointed out that when we had the tree rings that were thinner or narrower, that corresponded to colder weather and also corresponded to drier conditions. The trees did not grow quite as quickly during those spells of dry conditions and cold conditions as they did during spells of warmth and moisture. Well, what does that have to do with sunspots? Spora pointed out that in addition to the fact that we had no sunspots, that there was an unusual spell of very cold weather that occurred around that same time. Another gentleman uh, who lived during the 19th century, and this gentleman's name was John Dalton, and he pointed out the same thing. From 1790 to 1830, there was not much in the way of sunspot activity. Dalton was an English chemist, a physicist, and a meteorologist who studied all of this in the early 19th century. And he said, yeah, I agree with what uh, Dr. Sporer said and what uh, Gustav uh, Maunder said, not Gustav Maunder, uh, Edward Maunder said, that whenever there were very few sunspots, the weather across the earth, or at least across the Northern hemisphere, got very cold. There were, in fact, during that period from 1645 to 1715, it got so cold that uh, up in Scotland and Amsterdam, people were able to walk across the uh, ponds, lakes, and rivers. Uh, the Thames River in England froze. That doesn't happen very often. It certainly doesn't happen very often now, nowadays. And the most interesting thing of all, I think, is that we have an artifact of this cold weather and this lack of sunspots that appears every year in a story that you and I are well familiar with at Christmas time. That story was written by Charles Dickens in the early 19th century. It's a story about a Christmas carol, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, when you see that movie or television show or read the book, it always places us in the same scenario, same situation. England, jolly old England, Christmas time, cold, snow. Well, if you go to England now, in our era, that doesn't happen anymore. It's not cold. Rarely is it ever cold. Rarely does it ever snow to any significant degree around Christmas time. But back in the early 19th century, when Dickens wrote his story about Ebenezer Scrooge, that was a given. It was a given every year in December. It would get cold and it'd be snowy in England. That story, even though it doesn't seem to fall in line with the weather that we have today, that story fell in line with what we call the Dalton minimum, that period or lack of sunspots between 1790 and 1830. And would also, I guess, fall in line with what Spora pointed out in the 14 and 1500s and what um, uh, uh, Maunder pointed out in the late 1600s and early 1700s. The lack of any sunspots seems to indicate that we have cold weather. And uh, that is something that is uh, believed by a good number of reputable scientists. For example, here is a chart that was made by a Russian uh, uh, scientist by the name of Zarkova, who wrote a interesting uh, report back in 2015, where he aligns the period of cold weather, what we call the Little Ice Age, during the time of the Maunder Minimum and the Dalton Sunspot Minimum that we had a period here in the Northern Hemisphere called the Little Ice Age. And now when the sun became active again, and it's been very active in the 20th century, that we had uh, uh, a couple of double peaks here, uh, that the fact is that, that because the sun was so active that perhaps we saw an increase in the temperature of the atmosphere during that uh, time frame, during the mid and late part of the 20th century, the modern maximum. Now we're in cycle 25 right now, sunspot cycle 25. According to Zarkova, solar cycle 26 will mark the end of the modern era of sunspots. That after that, and we're talking now about, oh, 
the 2030s, after the 2030s, that it, we're going to lack, we're not going to see sunspots anymore. And just like in the Maunder minimum and Dalton minimum, with the lack of any sunspots, the atmosphere is going to turn cold. Could that counteract? Could that counteract global warming and climate change? The, the difference in solar cycles? This is what Zarkova points out. He said, look at solar cycle 21 and the peak of the sunspot cycle then. And then look at cycle 22 and 23 and 24. Each time the peak of the sunspot activity was lower than the previous cycle. And he said, well, it'll be even lower for cycle 25. And by 26, it won't be uh, of any significant degree. And after that, we'll have a long stretch when there'll be no sunspots, the atmosphere will turn cold, we will turn cold. That's what Zarkova claims. I hate to ruin this wonderful theory of Mr. Zarkova, but the fact of the matter is we're into cycle, sunspot cycle 25 right now, and we are seeing more sunspots, more solar flares happening now than we have during the previous four cycles. And we're not even at the peak yet. The peak is coming in 2025 in this 11 year cycle. So Zarkova was figuring that we would have another very weak sunspot cycle for the current cycle 25 and there wouldn't be much to talk about in the 2030s for cycle 26 and then that would be it for a long time, but it's not working out that way. The sun apparently has woken up. It has gotten very active again. And so this idea of sunspots maybe controlling the weather may not necessarily be true. And not necessarily true that we're not seeing the sun devoid of sunspots. There are sunspots on there right now. And about 12 years ago, I managed to get an interview with this gentleman. And this gentleman's name is Gavin Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt is a climatologist, a climate modeler, and the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York. I interviewed him for News 12 about oh, 12 years ago at the uh, Hudson River Museum, where he was giving a talk. And I asked him on camera, I said, Dr. Schmidt, what is it, what is it all about? Is, do, sunspots, do they control our weather when we have no sunspots? Does it get cold? When it, we have a lot of sunspots, it gets warm. And he looked at me and he almost dressed me down like a, a headmaster would dress down one of his students. He said, absolutely, and he, he's British, absolutely not. He said, the sun has no effect or hardly any effect on our atmosphere. So I, then I said, well, doctor, if that be the case, how can you explain the little ice age coinciding with those periods of no sunspot activity in the 1500s, the 1600s, the 17, the early 1800s? How could you explain that? And he said, very simply, the reason was volcanism. And during that time, according to Dr. Schmidt, during that long stretch, during the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, we had a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of volcanic eruptions and some major eruptions, which put up into the atmosphere, a cloud of uh, dust and ash. Now, when we do, when, when that happens and it spreads across the atmosphere in the Northern hemisphere, sunlight hits that cloud and bounces right back. Of course, you know, not all of it gets bounced back. There is sunlight that gets through the, this, these aerosol clouds, but the amount of sunlight is reduced, the amount of heat and light is reduced, and correspondingly, the atmosphere cools in response to these explosions, these eruptions. In fact, Dr. Schmidt pointed out, one of the greatest eruptions in the last millennia was Tambora, in 1815, there was a tremendous eruption, which took place in 1815, which fell right in during the time of the so-called Dalton sunspot minimum. And uh, Dr. Schmidt was trying to say, it's all coincidental that there were no sunspots at the same time we were getting all these volcanic eruptions. This one, Tambora, caused the so-called year without a summer here in the United States in 1816. So much ash and dust was put into the atmosphere, and so much um, uh, sunlight was reflected back out into space. The temperature cooled so drastically that in parts of New England, in 1816, it snowed every month of the year. It snowed in June, July, August, September. Temperatures were well below normal. Crops died. 
And again, it was all due not to the paucity of sunspots, but according to Dr. Schmidt, because of the tremendous amount of dust and ash put up into the atmosphere that reflected the sunlight back into space and dropped the temperature. And that could happen just as well today. A couple of weeks ago, we had a, a, a major uh, eruption on a far uh, island out in the South Pacific uh, that probably did not put out quite so much dust and ash as Tambora and probably would not really have any influence on our atmosphere. But if you ever get a hold of a really huge eruption, you may remember 30 years ago in the Philippines, we had one called Pinatubo, which changed weather patterns for a couple of years. So these things do have a say in our weather, but uh, still are very contentious. There's still people, scientists who believe it's the sun and not volcanoes. How about the planets? Could they affect us in any way, shape or form? Alignments of the planets? In fact, in 1974, a book came out that claimed that uh, a, an unusual alignment in 1982 was gonna cause a tremendous amount of sunspot activity and possibly trigger floods and earthquakes. The name of the book was called The Jupiter Effect because Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system and it would lead the way, so to speak. There was even a forward by Isaac Asimov of the book. Well, 1982 came and went, nothing happened. It was all a big hullabaloo, nothing happened. But the two guys who wrote this book, Gribben and Plageman, I'm sure must've made a lot of money for a short while because everybody was buying the book. It even made the New York Times bestseller list because people, you know, they, you, you write a book and get people scared. That is the thing that is compelling. That's the thing that gets everybody uh, to buy your book. But then it, it also caused an outbreak of other books, similar books like this one by this guy, Doug Clark, who wrote Earthquake 1982. And of course, again, Nothing like that happened, nothing at all. So it doesn't seem like planets have a say in either uh, the, the Earth or our weather. Although, here's a gentleman who does believe that they do have a say in our weather. Some of you may have heard of a man by the name of Jim Witt, who for the last, oh, almost 50 years has been on WHUD here in the Hudson Valley, 100.7. And he, he, learned the secret. Now, remember I told you about Harry Geis? He only stayed in New York for one year. Uh, he left after that famous year of 66 and went back to California. And the reason why he went back to California was he told Channel 2, the climate of New York doesn't, uh, I, I don't go with for that, the cold and the snow. I'd rather be in California where it's usually, you know, very mild all through the year. But after that snowstorm that he predicted for Christmas 1966, Jim Witt wrote him a letter and then called him up and said, I must know how you did that. I have to know. I'm amazed that you did it. And uh, Harry Geist told Jim Witt, you're not the first person to ask that. And I don't intend to tell anybody how I did that and how I made I, my methodology, my way of making long range predictions is going to be only known to me and me alone. He said, who are you to ask me that? And Jim Witt told him who he was. As it turned out, Jim Witt was a very special guy. This is the front cover. I just got it yesterday. Remember I told you about Weatherwise Magazine? This is the January, February 2022 issue of Weatherwise Magazine. And it tells about on the cover, the long lasting legacy of the Lakeland High School Weather Club. You see, Jim Witt, back in the 1960s, taught weather at Lakeland High School in Northern Westchester. And he had a weather club where he had kids who were so enthralled and interested in weather. And he was actually able to get high class weather equipment. He wrote to places where they were gonna throw out their teletypes. Don't throw them out, give them to us, we'll fix it. We'll fix them so that they're in working order. He even ended up writing to uh, a, a, a station, a weather station that was going to get rid of their radar, their weather radar, and said, let us have it. Let us, let, let our school, Lakeland High School, have the weather radar. And these kids that you see here in, in this black and white on the left-hand side, these kids grew up to become some of the most outstanding weather people in our time. Uh, so many of these now have made their names. The, the, the kid you see, the bespeckled kid in the middle there, 
That's Dr. Frank Marks, who ended up being the director of the Hurricane Research Division at the Atlantic Oceanogra Oceanog Oceanographic and Meteorology Laboratory for NOAA. Uh, there was others, Dr. Gregory Tripoli, Professor of at Atmospheric and Oceanic Services for the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. James uh, Peck, Dr. Gord Jordan uh, Alpert, Carl Silverman, Mike Steinberg, a senior meteorologist at AccuWeather, Pete Guglielmo, who did weather operations and forecasts and terminal forecasts for uh, many of the airports in the Northeast. All of these kids that you see who belong to that weather club back in the 1960s all grew up learning about meteorology from Jim Witt. He was the guy who educated them. And every one of them to a, to a man said, I wouldn't have gotten into this business. I wouldn't have learned all I learned without Jim Witt. And Jim Witt told Harry Geisis and said, I'm teaching kids how to learn about weather and forecasting. Harry Geis li listened and he said to Jim Witt, all right. He said, because you're teaching these kids, I'm gonna tell you not the entire way I, th that I do my forecast. I'm gonna give you some ideas, some hints. You make up your own methodology of how to do forecasts long range forecast. You make up your own forecast and, and, and you know, come up with your own ideas. And I think you'll be successful. He told Jim Witt some of the stuff that he was doing. Jim took about 20 years working on and developing his own methodology for weather casting, long range weather forecasting. And believe it or not, it came into play with the sun, the moon and the planets, for goodness sake. Jim uses the planets, the movement of the planets. I don't understand how he does that, but he, he says he, that's how he does it. And he puts out this calendar, this calendar every year since 1986, the Hudson Valley weather calendar with Jim Witt's long range forecast. And Jim uh, founded a foundation called the Hope for Youth Foundation. And every cent that Jim makes from selling this calendar and again, he's been doing it since 1986. Every penny has gone to the Hope for Youth Foundation. The Hope for Youth Foundation helps kids, which in the words of Jim, were dealt a bad hand in life. The money then goes to other foundations that help children, such as Ronald McDonald House, St. Jude, and many, many others. He has raised single-handedly from the sale of this calendar since 1986, over $4 million. And he must be doing a pretty good job because people keep buying the calendar, not necessarily maybe for the forecast, but to get these beautiful pictures. Jim in the back of his calendar has a listing of mother nature's upcoming more important dates to watch in the future. He's done this now all the way until the year 2028. And it's all based upon the moon, the sun and the planets. Dates that he says, we are going to have unusual changes, important changes, stormy changes to watch for. Um, I want to direct your attention to this. One in, indicates predictions based upon high energy cycles on the sun. Two are for locations of where the sun and the moon is. Uh, three, planetary connections. During spring and summer and autumn, a higher probability of rain. During the winter months, clearing or briefly cooler or colder weather, a cold front passage, which may induce colder temperatures and may also induce rain or ice or snow. Look at this, look at this now. These are the predictions for 2022. Are you looking? I'm looking at this date, February two to four. Today is February 3rd, right? What are we expecting for February tonight and tomorrow? We're expecting a cold front that's gonna change rain to ice, sleet, and maybe a touch of snow. If I, I don't know about you, I would give him a bullseye for that. And he made these predictions years and years ago, again, using the sun, moon, the stuff that Harry Geis told him about and the stuff that he developed for himself. So I, if you're interested, go online. You could type on Google Jim Witt weather or Jim Witt, Hope for Youth Foundation, because he's still selling these calendars for this year. And here are the other dates now that you can expect on settled conditions, March 9th to the 11th, May 9th to the 11th,
May 20 to 22. What are we going to get during those periods? Thunderstorms, maybe a late season snowstorm. I, I don't know. But Jim has done a fairly good job with all of these predictions. And he, he's, he, uh, this, this is pretty amazing. I told you about the planets. And I kind of poo-pooed that for myself until a report a few years ago from Dennis Kent of the very reputable Lamont Earth Observatory, Columbia University, in 2018, where he wrote, Jupiter and Venus are such strong influences because of their size and proximity. Venus is the nearest planet to us. Jupiter is much further away, but is the solar system's biggest planet. And according to Dr. Kent, every 405,000 years, due to wobbles in our orbit caused by the gravitational pulls of these two planets, seasonal differences here on Earth become more intense. Summers are hotter, winters are colder, dry times are drier, wet times are wetter. So maybe Jim and Harry Geis latched on to something. You know, maybe the planets do have a say in our day-to-day -day weather. Certainly, according to De Dennis Kent, over a very long, long period of time, they have a uh, say in our weather. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm going to close out this talk now with one note. When I was on News 12 for all of those years, I was on for over 20 years, I thought my prediction was, my accuracy rate was about 88, 89%. However, there were some times when I was wrong. And it seems to me that no one in my 21 years of doing weather, whenever I got it right, no one ever said, good job, Joe, you got it right. You got that snowstorm right on the nose. But when I got it wrong, if, for example, I uh, looked at uh, the maps and I said to everybody that night, tomorrow morning we're having a dusting of snow. And then I look out the next morning and I see four inches on the ground and it's still snowing. You know what I call that? I call that a gomer pile. I'd hear in the back of my head the voice of the late Jim Neighbors, who was gomer pile on television. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And that's when I heard it from the TV viewers. That's when everybody was saying, you got it wrong, Rayo. You busted it. It was the wrong. They never said I was right. They always used to say I was wrong, though. They always waited until I was wrong, and then, then I'd always hear from it. Well, you know what? That's not just in meteorology. That's in other professions as well. Take, for example, this guy. This guy, maybe some of you recognize him. Bill Buckner. Bill Buckner was probably one of the really great ball players of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, he just fell short of the Hall of Fame. He was a batting champion. He was a great hitter, could hit home runs. He was a great fielder. He had a high, I, th I think he, he won uh, the Golden Glove a couple of times. He was a great guy, but you know what? No one ever talks about all of what Bill Buckner did during his storied career. The only thing that everybody thinks about or talks about when the name Bill Buckner is mentioned is this sad episode in the 1986 World Series when a ground ball by Mookie Wilson of the Mets went through Bill Buckner's legs into the outfield, causing Ray Knight to score from third, and the Mets came from behind and won game six of the World Series. The next night, the Mets won the World Series, and everybody blamed Bill Buckner. And it, that's, that was unfair, really. It was one play out of so many in that series, and one play in the life of a guy who was really a guy who had a sterling career. Yet, Nobody ever complimented Bill Buckner when he hit a home run or drove in runs or won a batting championship. The only thing they ever did was say, you let the ball go through your legs. You blew it. You're a horrible ball player. But if Bill Buckner were alive, I'm sorry to say he passed away a few years ago. But if I had a chance to meet with Bill Buckner right now, I'd say, Bill, what happened to you is what we call in the weather business, the weatherman's lament. And here's how I'm ending tonight's talk. The weatherman's lament. Here is life's great December. These in the main are our regrets. When we're right, no one remembers. But when we're wrong, no one forgets. And that is the story of astro meteorology. And I want to thank all of you for listening to my, uh, my uh, blitherings for the last hour or so, my, actually an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and I want to thank you all for uh, uh, taking in all that I mentioned. And if you have any questions, uh, I can see the chat board here. Um, 
I see somebody here, uh, David Sadoff, uh, wrote The Eruption of Mount Tambora, famously thought to have inspired vividly colored backgrounds and romantic landscape paintings, as well as ghosts and horror stories. Yes, a lot of people talk about Krakatoa, but Tambora was a major, major eruption. Again, one of the top eruptions in the past thousand years. Um, somebody put up, I believe, yeah, there you go. If you want to know about um, purchasing Jim Witt's calendar, and again, none of it, none of the money goes to him or WHUD. It goes to uh, helping young kids in the uh, uh, Hope for Youth Foundation. And there is the link to that on the chat board there. Um, so if anybody has a question and want to un unmute yourself, I'll be very happy to try to answer them right now. Joe, I'm just going to stop you briefly. Thank you so much for uh, that wonderful presentation. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so people feel free to ask whatever you like. And uh, you get this as a bonus for being with us uh, in person. So thank you for joining us, everyone, and have a good night.